Yeah, I'm pretty sure you shouldn't exist. Seriously, though, our best guess is that Legends Arceus, the game where Pokeballs are only just starting to come into use, took place somewhere between 200 to 500 years ago. And yet, this thing from the ancient past somehow resembles one perfectly. It begs the question, which came first? Pokemon who look like Pokeballs or Pokeballs themselves? I'm going to need to look into the full history of Pokeballs for this one. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bucky Potobi here, and Fidget, don't even worry about it. I already did a video on this exact topic over on my channel like two years ago. Toby, did you just crash my video to suggest that you'd already made it over on your channel? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it quite like that. Uh, I, I just mean it'd be a good place for you to start for your research. After all, that video is outdated anyway. I did that video before Scarlet and Violet and Legends Arceus even released, and those two games probably reveal some of the biggest stuff when it comes to the origins of Pokeballs. Fine. Seeing as you're here anyway, do you want to help out with this one? Sure, I actually just came over to steal you and see if you'd be up for helping out on a video on my channel about the history of Paldea after this. Sounds like a plan. But first, let's explore the history of perhaps the franchise's most notable icon. Despite being a staple of the franchise since its inception, there's actually very little explanation as to how these things work. We can know the exact formula that calculates the catch rate of each individual Pokemon with any given Pokeball under a variety of circumstances, and yet, exactly what occurs when you bonk a Pokemon on the head with this thing is still a mystery. The anime has always alluded to the Pokemon converting to some sort of energy, perhaps breaking them down to pure infinity energy, but then Professor Laventon says that they utilize the Pokemon's innate ability to shrink themselves. I mean, in fairness, there's no reason it can't be a combination of the two, as since the 3D era, we've seen that same energy streak emit from the Pokeballs during a capture attempt, and both the anime and the manga have visually demonstrated the Pokemon residing within the balls in a shrunken state. Side note, I always thought the line about Pokemon shrinking was kind of weird, but we really do see it in-game. I especially noticed it in Scarlet and Violet with the Titan Pokemon. After you defeat them, they shrink in size and disappear. Arvin continuously states that you need to hurry before they come back. Maybe Pokemon really do shrink in size when weakened as a method of self-defense. Maybe that also explains why Pokeballs work better when the Pokemon are weakened. By inducing the shrunken state, it simulates the recovery process they would naturally revert to when fainted. That's why Ash always says in the anime that his Pokemon should return to their Pokeballs for a good rest. Despite the precise function remaining somewhat nebulous, over the years the history of Pokeballs has been slowly drip-fed to us, starting with things that aren't even Pokeballs. Before their invention, people used a variety of objects and tools in order to capture, control, and contain Pokemon. Most of these examples come from the anime, where we see things like an unearthly urn and a dark device, which hold gigantic Alakazam and Gengar respectively, which were later defeated in battle by another giant Pokemon, this time a Jigglypuff released from a bell. Or there's Sir Aaron's staff, which he uses to call forth his Lucario in the Mystery of Mew movie. And we know that the war that takes place at the beginning of the film dates to around a thousand years ago, so people have been capturing Pokemon for at least that long. Though in Arceus and the Jewel of Life, Ash and his friends are flung thousands of years into the past, to a time before Pokemon were even recognized as such. Instead, they were referred to as magical creatures. In this time period specifically, armor was used to control the minds and wills of Pokemon, a far cry from the modern day Pokeball. Of course you don't have these yet. All of this artifact usage came to a head 500 years ago with two big instances. The first was Spiritomb being bound to the odd keystone. Due to its mischievous nature, this creature formed of 108 spirits had a spell cast upon it to trap it within the keystone. The dex entries in black and white specifically say that a spell was used to bind Spiritomb. We know Pokemon have always had an air of mysticism about them. After all, they were originally called magical creatures. They are formed of infinity energy, the life force that grants them their elemental abilities. There's also the existence of Aura, which Pokemon like Lucario are known to have control over, and it's possible this is another form or way of manipulating infinity energy. In a similar manner, it seems humans in the Pokemon universe used to have access to magic, which would later develop and evolve into the science of the modern day that allows for Pokeballs, teleporters, artificial intelligence, and space lasers to exist. What do you call science that's based on magic again? Alchemy. Yeah, that does keep coming up, doesn't it? It's likely that alchemy was utilized in the creation of the very first Pokeball, Magearna. ish Magearna clearly resembles a Pokeball, especially in its original form. However, 
it isn't exactly used to capture other Pokemon. Magearna only exists in the form it does due to its soul harm, that blue sphere at the center of its chest, which was created by capturing the life energy of numerous Pokemon and containing them to form a singular entity of an artificial soul. Due to this, Magearna feels the pain of other Pokemon. This is really messed up. It is unfortunately not the last time that a Pokemon will be sacrificed for their life energy in the pursuit of Pokeballs, but we'll come to that shortly. Firstly, we get to look at the creation of what we would recognize as a Pokeball, those being the ones used in Hisui, made from Apricorns and Tumblestone. We can assume that these are pretty similar, if not exactly the same as the ones first designed in Johto by the great smiths of the era. If you check out the video on my channel that Fidget and I previously worked on together, you'll see that Tumblestones inherently contain traces of infinity energy within, likely leading to their ability to form capture devices. This is where we see our first instance of a Pokemon resembling a Pokeball. It depends on your definition of first. Okay, granted, but perhaps people's first interaction with a Pokemon that resembled a Pokeball, especially the ones used at that time, as Hisui and Voltorb of this period seem to resemble the Apricorn-made Pokeballs, even possessing the grass typing. Interestingly, we know that Voltorb's original role within the games was that of a Mimic, a common RPG monster that looks like an item or treasure chest which catches the player off guard when they attack. The in-world explanation for them was less clear, as they seem to just appear one day in Pokeball factories. With Hisui and Voltorb, however, it is possible that we have a clear reasoning for their appearance, as well as their behavior in their modern day forms. You see, Hisui and Voltorb have a friendly demeanor and enjoy the company of people, so it's possible that they adopted the form that they have to be better accepted and loved by humanity, who at this point still distrusted wild Pokemon, but they were beginning to capture Pokemon of their own and store them within Pokeballs. They weren't fully welcomed by people, unfortunately, due to their tendency to discharge electrical energy from the hole on the top of their heads. However, as the designs of Pokeballs developed and people stepped away from using Apricorns, Voltorb adapted to their modern form, which lacked the top hole. With none of their electricity discharging, however, they instead started exploding, making them even more of a nuisance than they originally were. No wonder the modern day Voltorb looks so angry. Let's not forget perhaps the most unique Pokeball we see in Legends Arceus, that being the Origin Ball. Made from the same ore that formed the Red Chain, arguably what we could consider the earliest possible artifact that could contain a Pokemon's power, being formed by Azelf, Uxie, and Mesprit to control the forces of Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina. The Origin Ball is the first Pokeball to ever have 100% catch rate, with the power to capture even the most powerful Pokemon in their greatest forms. Similar though to what would eventually be the case with the Master Ball, the ability to capture any Pokemon without fail could only be entrusted to the most worthy of trainers, lest their power be abused. Cough, cough, foreshadowing. Did you just say cough, cough? The design of Pokeballs would then change over the centuries, as too would the materials used in their creation. Eventually, people landed on the design that we saw in the fourth Pokemon movie called, well, it's called lots of things depending on where you're from, but it's the Celebi one. In that film, a young Samuel Oak of 40 years ago travels to the modern day. The Pokeballs of his time somewhat resemble the original concept art for capsules. Now, we know the same Samuel Oak who traveled to the future witnessed Ash's Pokedex, which he then went on to develop once back in his own time period. It's possible, I'd argue highly likely, that after seeing the design of the Pokeballs Ash used, he would work with his friend Kurt to develop what would become the modern day Pokeball. It's possible that the GS, or Greatest Smith's Ball, is the prototype for all modern Pokeball designs. That design was then taken and put into mass production by both Silphco and the Devon Corp, the latter of which have admitted to experimenting with Pokemon Life Energy, or what they refer to as Infinity Energy, to further their technological research and become a market leader. Ah, capitalism. Truly making monsters of us all. So true. Anyway. Pokeballs are now made en masse in factories like the one we see in Kalos, and are able to be produced at such quantities that as for the standard Pokeball, it only ends up costing the end consumer a mere 200 Poke Dollars, the same price as a bottle of water. Considering the technical marvel that Pokeballs are, that is a ridiculously cheap price, to the point where we believe people consider them to be completely disposable. It used to be thought that when you failed to catch a Pokemon with a Pokeball, either by missing it in the first generation or by the Pokemon breaking free, that the Pokeball was breaking and was broken beyond repair. That's why you couldn't use it again. But considering that Yamper possesses the ability to ball fetch, where it will retrieve a Pokeball from a failed capture attempt, it actually suggests that people think so little of these items that they're not even worth picking back up. 
I always assumed that the cat trait of the Pokeball had something to do with how comfortable they were for the Pokemon and how willing that Pokemon was to remain inside it, but maybe it's just expected that a portion of the Pokeballs are faulty. Never mind them being cheap. I want a refund on these. Sacrificing the life of Pokemon in order to develop e-waste. Yep, that sounds like something a mega corporation would do. Of course, they had to push their research and develop the Master Ball, a Pokeball that never fails to catch a Pokemon. That is, unless of course, it eats it? The anime is really weird when it comes to Pokeballs. Oh, you just wait. As stated earlier, these were never put into mass production, mostly due to the knowledge that evil teams like Team Rocket could misuse such an item. Instead, the limited number that were produced were either given to researchers or, as is the case in the Uva and Naranja Academy, people who achieve outstanding results regardless of the field. This is a problem because it allowed Sada and Turo to get their hands on a whole bunch of them and start sending them through time to capture Pokemon from the far past and future. Therein lies the answer to our original question. Why does Brute Bonnet look like a Pokeball? Timey-wimey. Timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff. Very specifically, what we'd refer to as a bootstrap paradox. Here's what I think happened. Professor Sada creates the time machine and sends Pokeballs back to the ancient times in an attempt to capture Pokemon. The actual time period that she sends them back to vary by possibly thousands or even millions of years. After all, Screentail is said to be from one billion years ago. So it's certainly possible that during that time, Pokemon evolved and adapted. Remember that Hisui and Pokemon managed to evolve into their modern day counterparts in less than 500 years. Pokemon do adapt quickly. In a time before human interference in nature, and certainly before the prevalence of Pokeballs, these time-traveling objects would be considered by the Pokemon to simply be predators. Think about it from a primitive creature's point of view. This small flying predator appears from nowhere, opens its jaws, swallows its prey whole, and vanishes instantly. That's terrifying. It's common in the animal kingdom for creatures that would be prey to evolve traits or appearances in order to deter predators. Take, for instance, the owl butterfly. Suggesting that an earlier version of Brute Bonnet needed to deter a predator, perhaps Slitherwing, whose typing would make it the perfect predator for Brute Bonnet, this would-be prey developed an adaptation to disguise itself as an even more terrifying predator, the time-traveling Pokeballs, which allowed it to thrive. Then, when Pokeballs actually came into common use after millions of years, their descendants, Fungus and Amoongus, benefited from this adaptation by luring in people, allowing them to spread their spores and multiply. What's crazy though, is that in Fungus's latest dex entry, it's noted that the person who finalized the design of Pokeballs was a fan of Fungus, suggesting that they were based on the Pokemon who adapted to look like that very same Pokeball. You know what makes this even more likely to be the case? Even though Voltorb and Fungus both resemble Pokeballs, Voltorb Shiny has always been blue to resemble a Great Ball, but Fungus and Brute Bonnet both have a purple shiny to resemble the Master Balls Sada eventually started sending back when she had wider access to them as shown in the final battle with her. Do you know what else is cool? When I first made my History of Pokeballs videos, there were a bunch of outliers that didn't make sense from the anime, like the 20,000 year old stone Pokeball that held Claydol, or the stone orb that's shaped like a Pokeball that contains the spirit of the king of Pokelantis. Uh, don't worry about it, it's not important. But what is important is that it never made sense to me that these designs would show up so long ago, way before Pokeballs were first made, and certainly before the modern day design was fully adopted. But thanks to Scarlet and Violet, this now all makes sense. AI Sada travels back in time with all of her Pokeballs to early humanity. She and her technology would quite frankly be revered as a god. This is also the case in Legends Arceus, where not only is the player character just two to 500 years ago thought of being an exceptional skill for just being able to catch so many wild Pokemon, but in the huts of the Diamond and Pearl clan, you can see an image of the original hero wearing Pokeballs around his neck. This person is likely a time traveler too. So the Pokeball over time has become a symbol of incredible power, and these instances of time travelers or the Pokeball itself just appearing in the past would be an image burnt into the collective zeitgeist of humanity. As humans developed, one bit of iconography would exist, the Pokeball. Ancient treasures share its form and even gifts to royalty are shaped in its image. So Pokeballs are the combination of science and magic, have cost countless Pokemon their lives over the years, and only exist in the current state because of time travel. Eh. Do you ever feel like the more we learn about the Pokemon universe, the less sense it makes? 
And if you're wondering how much time travel messed with the rest of the Pokemon world's history, why not check out the video we did over on Toby's channel? Because that's going to do it for today, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join us again on the next one. But until then, I'll catch you later.